Hi. Today, let's take a look at the I squared C serial interface. As you can see, the I squared C interface is half duplex. It's lower speed, a maximum of one megahertz. However, the big plus, it only uses two wires. In contrast to SPI, which uses three wires plus an additional wire for every component. Therefore, it is the best if you're trying to reduce external pin usage. The I squared C is a bus in its own right, in the sense that each device on the bus has a specific address. As an analogy, Every device in the internet has a unique address which allows you to move data from one computer to another. In the same way, every chip on an I squared C bus will have that unique address. In order for each chip to possess its own address, we need to be able to physically tell a specific chip what its address is. And you can see that capability provided here on this chip. Three external connections actually determine the address of that chip. For another chip, again, three pins allow determination of a specific address. For the bus to work, we need to make two specific connections. The serial clock line, SCL, needs to be connected to the SCL on each I squared peripheral on the bus. Likewise, the SDA, serial data line, needs to be connected to each of the peripherals on the bus. In addition, it's essential that that pull-up resistor, one for the serial clock line and one for the serial data line, be included in the design because of the nature of I squared C. It's fundamentally an open collector bus. The SCL and SDA lines will pull a signal low, but they will not typically drive it high, instead relying on these two resistors to provide the pull-up to power capability of the bus. Now that we've covered the electrical specifications of the I squared C bus, let's turn to the protocol specification. In other words, what sequence of messages on the bus allows us to move data back and forth. The most important feature, and the thing that actually allows the unique address assignment for each at each element on the bus, is an address, an 8-bit value, sent at the beginning of each I squared C transaction. The topmost four bits are determined based on the type of device. For example, a serial double EEPROM will always have the pattern 1010. The next three bits, labeled A2, A1, and A0, are determined based on the connection of the A2, A1, and A0 pins, which appear on many I squared C devices. Finally, the last bit, read write will be 1 or true on a read transaction, 0 false on a write transaction. In a given I squared C transaction, a, a byte is exchanged in the following fashion. First of all, at the beginning of each transaction, a start signal occurs. This is when the SDA line falls low while the clock is high. Otherwise, the SDA line does not transition while the clock is high. Likewise, the special condition of a low to high transition on SDA when the clock is high signals the termination or stop of an entire I squared C bus transaction. In between those start and stop points, a series of bytes will be transmitted and received. In particular, bytes are transmitted from the most significant byte down to the least significant byte. After eight bytes are transmitted, a ninth, eight bits, excuse me, are transmitted, a ninth bit, the acknowledge bit, is then sent by the receiver of the transmission to indicate whether the transmission was successful or additional steps need to be taken. So notice that every byte transferred takes 
9 bits, not 8 bits, because of that additional acknowledge bit. As usual, the I2C protocol on the PIC24 microcontroller is implemented in hardware, and a number of control and status registers allow the user to write code which then implements the I2C protocol on the PIC. What we'll focus on today is the use of some slightly higher level functions. We'd like, for example, to begin an I2C transaction with a start and end it with a stop. During a transaction, we'll find that it's useful to put data or get data 8 bits at a time on the bus. We're going to focus on using these primitive operations to transfer data to a device on the I2C bus. In order to make use of these primitive transactions, let's now look at a higher level view of the I2C protocol itself. In particular, these diagrams review briefly the contents of an I2C read or write transaction. A read transaction begins with a start bit. It's the condition discussed earlier in which the data line goes low. Likewise, we'll terminate the transaction with a stop. Here, shown with a P, in between the start and the stop, we'll transfer data 8 bits at a time, followed by a single acknowledgement bit. These 8-bit data packets repeated in the proper sequence actually define the protocol. The first thing sent on the I2C bus is always the address of the de desired device. So the I2C transaction will always begin with a put of the address, recalling that the address consists of 4 bits determined by the, by the device, followed by 3 bits dependent on how the device is physically connected, and then a read or write to indicate the type of transaction. In summary, a typical program will therefore begin with a start function, be followed by a put function to output the address. Because this is a write transaction, the read write bit is set to 0. All following transactions up to the end consist of a series of puts, or writing data from the PIC to a peripheral listening to the PIC. In contrast, a read transaction has a 1 for the read write bit. As before, there's a start and a stop at both ends of the transaction, but we first write the address and wait for an with the one bit and wait for it acknowledge and then we read data back using the get i2c function. Read it again to signal the end of the i2c transaction we don't acknowledge the last element of that transaction which causes the peripheral address to cease sending data and the pick then follows up by sending a stop. Let's look at a couple specific code examples that illustrate this sequence. For example, here's one of the upper level functions, write, I2, write 1, I2C1. We begin with a start. We output the address with the write bit set. We output one data byte to write, and then we stop. To write two data bytes, again a start, send the address with the write bit set, two data bytes, and a stop. Read transactions operate in a sim similar manner. We start, we write the address, but we set that read bit to a 1, indicating that this is a read address, and then we use the get function to read a single byte of data. We use I2C NAC there to indicate that this is the last byte requested. When we're requesting two bytes, again we'll start, put out the address with the read bit set, get the first byte and acknowledge it, indicating we'd like more data, read the second byte and no acknowledge it, indicating that this is the end of the transaction, and then terminate it with the stop function. 